The boreal forest is a land of permafrost, peatlands, and blankets of evergreen forest. In Canada, the boreal forest covers almost 60% of the land surface and is home to large populations of various wildlife, including wolves, bears, bison, and the iconic boreal caribou. The boreal forest is the largest intact forested biome on the planet, but resource extraction and urbanization are leading to forest loss and fragmentation. Simultaneously, climate warming and associated increases in wildfire activity and permafrost thaw are making the boreal forest more vulnerable to change. Changes in the extent and composition of boreal forests alter habitat quality and availability for wildlife, notably boreal caribou whose survival depends on large areas of mature forest. The population size of most of Canada's caribou herds has been declining dramatically in past decades because of human disturbances in their habitat. The Northwest Territories is home to one of the largest undisturbed caribou ranges with a population of six to 7,000 individuals. Currently, this population is considered stable because of low levels of human disturbance in the landscape. However, habitat disturbances in the Northwest Territories are expected to increase with ongoing climate warming. Rates of climate warming in the Northwest Territories and other high northern latitudes are three to four times greater than the global average. This rapid warming is accelerating rates of permafrost thaw and increasing wildfire activity. Wildfire has always been a part of the boreal ecosystem and is critical for forest regeneration. However, when fires become larger, more frequent, or more severe, the area of disturbed caribou habitat grows and forests do not always recover the way they have in the past. In the Northwest Territories, 2014 was an extreme fire year with wildfires impacting 2.85 million hectares of forest land and disturbing 3% of the available caribou habitat. When fires become more frequent, regeneration of trees and ground vegetation can be impacted. Cladonia lichen, which are also called caribou lichen because they are an important forage for caribou, exemplifies this challenge. These types of lichen need 40 to 70 years to recover from a fire. As fires become more frequent with a warming climate, caribou lichen recovery will be negatively impacted, leading to reductions in the quality of caribou habitat. The regeneration of forests after fire is even more complex in areas underlain by permafrost. Permafrost refers to soils that are at or below freezing year-round. With ongoing climate warming, permafrost is thawing, altering growing conditions for plants in these areas. For example, nutrients stored in permafrost soils can become available for plant use. Since wildfires heat the ground, wildfire activity can further amplify ongoing thaw, which can modify vegetation recovery after fire. In the aftermath of the 2014 fires, many gaps in our understanding of fire impacts in the Northwest Territories were identified, including how does fire impact forest and vegetation recovery and what does this mean for wildlife habitat, especially caribou? What are the cumulative effects of fire and permafrost thaw on forest recovery following fire? Do caribou use newly burned areas? And finally, the need to be able to scale this information to large areas in support of wildlife management and planning was identified. To this end, a large network of monitoring plots was established in forests throughout the Decho, Satu, and North and South Sleeve regions. This network contains today more than 600 sites spanning a gradient of time after fire and in areas with and without permafrost. At each site, vegetation is monitored so we can better understand forest and ground vegetation recovery in response to wildfire, permafrost thaw, and their interaction. During the field season of 2021, we returned to several of these sites to collect data for five different but interrelated projects. The Caribou Mobility Project contributes to better understanding how caribou respond to post-fire habitat changes and to identify habitat features that may impede their movement. In the Northwest Territory, it has been observed that caribou select recently burned areas while they avoid slightly older burns in the summer. This was an unexpected observation. Burn areas have reduced lichen biomass and are thought to have increased predation risk, and therefore it was expected that caribou would avoid recently burned forests. This new observation raised many questions. Why are caribou using these early post-fire habitats 
and why and when do they cease to use them? One possibility is that caribou may select recently burned areas to fulfill their nutritional requirements. However, over time, deadwood and dense regrowth increases. This may impede caribou mobility, resulting in an increased intermittent cost and increased predation risk. As a result, caribou may cease to use these regenerating areas. Through this project, I am to improve our understanding of caribou impediments to movement in recently burned and regenerating forests. To do this, I use a Fitbit watch to measure how difficult it was to move through different habitat conditions in burns of different age or level of down wood. The activity monitoring data will be linked to tree regeneration and the amount, condition, and configuration of dead wood. This would allow me to develop predictive model of post-fire habitat accessibility that will be related to caribou GPS collar data and to determine how difficult it is for caribou to move in a post-fire landscape in current and future environmental conditions. The Fire and Ice Project contributes to our understanding of changing caribou habitat availability by exploring how fire and permafrost thaw impact post-fire vegetation recovery in boreal forests. Fire is a natural disturbance in the boreal, and it is because of fires that we can find so many different types of forest in the boreal biome. Some parts of the boreal are underlain by soils that are frozen all year round. These soils are called permafrost. Wildfires in forest with permafrost initiate or accelerate permafrost thaw by heating the frozen soils during fire and by increasing energy inputs to the ground after fire as insulating peat soil layers are burned away and shading from trees is reduced or completely eliminated. The cumulative effects of fire and permafrost thaw may have significant effects on vegetation recovery after fire, but we don't know yet what they are. To find out more, we established plots in forests that burned in 2014 in areas with and without permafrost. We monitored changes in the plant community composition by measuring all vegetation in these plots, first in 2015, right after the fire, and again in 2021, seven years after the fire and following recovery. These data will allow us to compare how vegetation growth differs at sites impacted by fire alone and those where fire and permafrost interact to determine forest recovery. The goal of the Ice and Roots project is to evaluate whether nutrients released from thawing permafrost can alter post-fire vegetation recovery and consequently wildlife habitat. Just like caribou consume plants for nutrition, soils provide the necessary nutrients for plants. The availability of nutrients determines how well plants will grow and which plants will do best. In many parts of the boreal forest, Soils are frozen all year round, meaning the nutrients that are available to plants are limited to those in unfrozen surface soils, and those in the permafrost are locked away. As permafrost thaws because of wildfire or climate warming, those nutrients are released and may be accessible to plants. Will this release of nutrients from thawing permafrost affect forest regeneration processes after fire? To answer this question, we visited recently burned plots with different thaw depths, ranging from near the soil surface to very deep within the soil profile. At each plot, we sampled aspen and black spruce tree seedlings and their roots. We also sampled the soils under these seedlings all the way down to the permafrost thaw front, which at some plots was close to two meters deep. From the soil cores, we are going to measure rooting depth, soil nutrient availability, and mycorrhiza fungi associations. Mycorrhiza fungi are like an extension of plant roots, helping plants access soil nutrients that are farther away from the roots. Understanding the ability of plants to access nutrients from thawing permafrost is important to determine how ongoing thaw may alter which tree and plant species are most successful with implications for forest recovery and wildlife habitat.
the lichen seeding project aims to evaluate how lichen recovery after fire can be accelerated. Because lichen is a key caribou forage, this project has direct management applications for caribou habitat recovery. If caribou lichen is disturbed, for example by a wildfire, it can take a long time, at least 40 to 70 years, before lichen beds reach pre-fire biomass levels. This is why pristine lichen mats can be reduced or even lost from the landscape if wildfire is more frequent in the boreal forest, as predicted. One reason why lichen recovery takes such a long time is establishment is very slow after disturbance. We explored if it was possible to speed up the process of recovery by manually seeding lichen into disturbed areas and understanding the environmental conditions that modify this recovery. To consider these questions, we established lichen seeding plots at existing sites in our site network within Southern Northwest Territories. These sites spanned a range of environmental conditions. Lichen seeding involves dispersing small lichen fragments from which new lichen mats will grow if the conditions are favorable. To get the lichen fragments for our seeding efforts, we collected lichen mats and broke them up by hand into small pieces. These pieces were used as the seeds to sow into our plots. In the coming years, we will return to the plots and track the establishment of these seedlings or lichen seeds. In the long term, this research program will help us identify whether lichen seeding is a viable management tool, and if so, which disturbed areas in southern NWT are best suited for lichen seeding with the goal of accelerating caribou habitat recovery on the landscape. The goal of the Eye in the Sky project is to support the mapping of valuable caribou habitat. Valuable caribou habitat has high amounts of Cladonia lichen, a forage type favored by caribou. It would, of course, be impossible to walk through the vast boreal forest and find and map areas with large amounts of lichen. So, how else can we find and map the habitat that is valuable for caribou? by using remote sensing techniques, including using drones, airplanes and satellites to identify and map lichen-rich parts of the landscape that would otherwise be inaccessible for humans. In the summer of 2021, we walked through the boreal forest with mosquito clouds around our heads to access over 40 sites that are spread across the South and Northwest Territories. At each site, we flew a drone and collected thousands of images. The drone data gives us a very detailed image of the vegetation and we can even create 3D models of the forest canopy or the ground surface. The lichen in the images are nicely visible because they are light colored and sent out against the green vegetation, which allows us to create lichen maps from the drone data. To create lichen maps that cover the entire Northwest Territories, the drone data is combined with satellite images and images taken from airplanes during NASA's Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment campaigns. These maps, we hope, will support caribou range management planning efforts in the Northwest Territories. We are currently working on the maps with the Northwest Territories Center of Geomatics and hope that they will be available by the end of 2022, so stay tuned. <laughs>